So I'm going to start pretty basic. Uh, I'm going to start with monoids, right? Is um, a monoid okay in the sense that does everyone know what a monoid is? I know what a monoid is. Okay, cool. So cool. That. Uh, ah, right. You won't be able to see the board if I put it up. That's uh, action. I Monoid M is a set A, and I'm going to do a right action. Um, it's a set A equipped with a map from A cross M A which has some additional requirements, namely that if I combine elements in the monoid, uh, let's call the multiplication mu, uh, and then I combine things using the action, then it's the same as applying the action twice in succession. Okay, straightforward should be fairly familiar. So, right. Given a topology on M, how um, an action call it A alpha, right? So A is the object, alpha is the map. Uh, and I have a notion of continuity is continuous. So here I'm treating A <coughs> as a discrete space. So in particular, in order for this map to be continuous for A, a discrete space, I just need to check the fibers. Um, so if alpha inverse of a uh, contained in A cross M is a union of uh, subsets of the form A primed cross U for all A and A, uh, A primed is an A, and U is in L. Okay, all basic stuff so far. Now, not, maybe none of you uh, know me, but I am a category theorist. And so if I'm giving you these definitions, it's because I want to construct a category of these objects. So I should tell you what the morphisms between these things are, and it's going to be the same for both. So a morphism of So if I understand uh, correctly, this, this just says it's continuous when I give A the discrete topology. Right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, so here I want from a alpha to b beta is a function from a to b such that this the thing that you would expect commutes right so i've got h here i've got h cross the identity and here i've got my action maps okay uh is that legible so far is everything okay so far Yep. Okay. And we're which direction should I be moving over here? Right. Cool. So, uh, because I'm just defining it as functions with conditions, these things are all compositional. 
Uh, so we get any topological monoid. Now, okay, there's a caveat here that you'll probably spot straight away, but I'm just saying I'm aware of it. Monoid M tau. We have a category, which I'm going to name like this, of continuous functions of this top topological monoid. Now, technically, the definition I gave earlier works for any topology whatsoever on my monoid. In particular, I don't have to care whether the topology interacts well with the multiplication. Um, and as it will turn out, that will be true throughout, but we will eventually refine our monoids such that that won't be a problem anymore, in the sense that, well, I should get on to what Morita equivalence is. So, to Morita equivalent. So if comps and tau is equivalent to the actions of the second one. So I should say that obviously those are the names I'm giving to my topological monoids. Okay, so the reason I put on discrete spaces in brackets is because whenever I have an algebraic object and a way of constructing a category out of it, I get in a in a consistent way, um, I get this notion of Morita equivalence, which is just saying two objects such that when I perform this construction, I get equivalent categories out. And so there's a broad class of Morita equivalence problems, uh, which is to say, I've given you this definition, and it's not clear, for instance, whether there are any interesting examples of Morita equivalent monoids, um, what can happen, which properties are preserved, and so on. Um, so let's have a look at some such problems. What kinds of thing are Morita equivalent to? So let's look at an example. Uh, let G be a discrete group then well in, in fact let's go with slightly more general uh, let's go with and be a discrete monoid. Then we have a canonical action then on itself. Okay. By multiplication. Um, what's the, the, re the reason I need the monoid to be discrete in this case is because um, I'm always treating my sets as discrete spaces, which means that uh, this action is not continuous as soon as we equip M with a non-trivial or non-discrete topology. So what's, I mean, obviously it's canonical in the sense that you only need the monoid in order to discover this, this action. Um, 
but categorically speaking, this is quite a convenient object to have. Let me move over to another board. So while I've constructed this, this category, get four parameter. Um, it's great to set. And let's call this big U. Um, so while I've constructed this category for you, um, there are some quote obvious uh, functors that I can um, equip it with. And this is the first one. It's the one that takes an action and gives me the underlying set where I've forgotten what the action does. Um, so I should prove that. So the claim is that uh, amounts to saying that there is a correspondence and it has to be natural, uh, but I'm going to leave the, the, the details of why it's natural to, to you as an exercise to some extent um, between uh, morphisms and mu to a alpha and elements uh, a in a. Okay, so I, all I have to do is construct this correspondence. So in one direction, uh, let's say f. So in one direction, f gets mapped to f of one in the other uh, I need a gets mapped to this thing. Okay, so there are a couple of things to check. The first is that this is genuinely a valid homomorphism, uh, which follows from the the associativity axiom for the multiplication, which I didn't make explicit because you already know what moids are, um, as well as the axiom that the uh, that alpha has to satisfy. Um, and this is actually right off of a... Um, okay. What other functors can I equip this with? Uh, actually, how am I doing this time? I'm only a quarter of an hour in. I might as well entertain you by telling you a bit more about these about these categories. Uh, so, discrete case. Well, you has. Left and right adjoints. Uh, okay, I will summarize what I'm about to write in, in a diagram shortly. Um, I also have for each set A, let's use a different notation. Uh, for each set X, there is a trivial of m on x, i.e. I just take the, the projection. This is functorial. And this, so I get a trivial action functor which 
from sets to categories of actions of my um, discrete monoid uh, and as adjuncts. Okay, so to summarize, I have this, and the fact that this is discrete is important. Um, I have my forgetful functor that I constructed earlier, and my trivial action functor, which I've just mentioned. And so this has an adjoint on the left, which just takes a set and gives me the product with M. I'm just going to say what these things do on objects, but feel free to stop me and if you want to hear what it does on morphisms. Uh, okay, this one takes an action here and the connected components. Okay, that's a little bit small, but you probably still legible. And on the other side, I have the uh, fixed points. Okay, any questions so far? All right. Spellbinding. <laughs> uh, U is monadic and co-monadic. Uh, so proof already have. I think you probably shouldn't address. presume people know what those terms mean. Uh, fair enough. Okay. Um, so being monadic is saying, um, in fact, let me, let me return, return to stand in front of the previous board. So whenever I have an adjunction, I have on one side, uh, an induced monad and on the other side, uh, an induced co-monad. So, so maybe I'll, I'll quickly draw the, the diagram for that. So side. Um, so I'm saying here, I can start from sets and I can go around and apply these two functors. Um, and I end up with a monad on sets. So that's a functor from set to set, uh, which additionally I can compare via natural transformations um, the identity functor to this one. And similarly, I can compose this with itself and I can compare that composite with the original thing. So uh, being monadic means that this that the algebras for this monad and you'll notice in this particular case that um, if you've seen the definition of algebras for a monad uh, they look like let me give this uh, a name let's call this q so uh, an algebra for a monad looks like a morphism like this, which satisfies some um, additional properties, which look a lot, which look suspiciously, one might say, uh, like the condition that I gave on um, an action uh, coincide uh, equivalent to. Of 
Algebras for this word is equivalent to this category. So, I mean, in fact, having having stated what precisely what this means, uh, I'm not going to conclude the proof uh, because it amounts to saying when I take the definition of algebras for a monad and I apply it to this um, particular situation. Excuse the interruption. Uh, and I apply to this particular situation, um, I end up getting back exactly the definition of actions that I started with. Okay, now why, why does this matter? Why am I mentioning this at all if it reduces to that observation that these two definitions coincide? The reason is that when I have a monadic functor, um, that means that everything that happens in uh, this category. is determined by that forgetful functor in the sense that I can entirely reconstruct the category just by looking at um, this, this monad that I've constructed from this functor. Um, so there's a, a bunch of general category theory results that tell me that um, I can deduce many, many properties of um, this category of actions from this fact. Uh, but the one I'm going to tell you without going into too much depth as to um, the full contents of, of the full consequences of this result um, actually use the other side of this um, of this junction. So I, I've mentioned what monadic means. Co-monadic is the same, but where I look at the right adjoint instead. So let me go over to another board. So this is A. So the conclusion from comonadicity um, is that this is a topos. Um, I, I will variously mention properties of toposes as we continue um, to, to the effect that me giving a, a um, detailed definition of what a topos is would just be a derailment. Um, but uh, which type of topos do you mean? A growth index topos? Uh, so, so the comonadicity specifically gives me an elementary topos, but in fact, this is just the category of pre sheaves on my uh, on my monoid, where M is viewed as a one object category. So, for those not familiar with this notation, I'm saying when I have a monoid, I can treat that as a special case of a category. I can look at functors out of that category into sets. And if I um, rearrange the definition of, of that, I end up with exactly a monoid action. Um, and similarly, the natural transformations between those functors reduce to the types of transformation between actions that I described earlier. So this is, um, I, I don't actually need this, uh, this result which is the result. So this is. What's wrong with pre sheaf topoi? <laughs> Why just? Uh, there is nothing wrong with pre sheaf topoi. The, the point is that if I already know that this is a pre sheaf topos, I don't need an extra result to tell me that it's a topos because I know it by other means. That if E is monadic over a topos, then he is also a topos. Um, OK, great. So I've, I've introduced these things. I've given you various results for a special case. 
Um, so you probably want to see logic sooner rather than later. So, moreover. Oh, wait, sorry, Morgan. Wasn't comodatic a feature of a functor? So you're saying, so A here is a category or it's a functor? Uh, so if I, okay, yeah, what do I mean by this, by this phrase? I mean, <clears throat> E to T, there exists a functor which is comonadic. Where T is the, T is something that I know is a topos, E is a category which I haven't yet established the properties of, but I have this functor with this nice property. Yeah, okay. That's that enough sense. for me to, to deduce all of the, all of the um, structure defining a topos, none of which I told you about. Um, but I, I will be recycling this result shortly for a case which it doesn't give me a pre sheaf topos and where I, where I actually need this result to, um, to get me there. So, moreover, uh, you left a joint to this right hander junction. So, this is the one that induces the comonad on sets. Um, of which my category of actions is the co-algebras um, is a geometric morphism uh, set to okay so now it's unfair for me to keep using all these terms which uh, which you might not be familiar with. So um, let me give at least a um, some explanation. So a topos refers to a Whoops. Whoops. Funky colors, all right. Um, I.e. a co-complete category, which is Cartesian closed. Which As a sub object classifier, uh, and has a small generating set objects. So don't be scared of this definition because I won't be using most of it. This is just listing nice properties that we know that these that these categories have. Um, and I'm going to be cheating a little bit because the result I mentioned on the previous board uh, that comonadicity is enough to guarantee that I'm a topos. That's actually only that's true in the broader picture of um, elementary toposes, but it if you if you care about the details, the other time that I will apply that result, um, the adjunction that I will use it on will have good enough properties to actually guarantee that I do have a great many topics. Um, so I should also say what a geometric morphism is. So as, as you can gather from the previous board, um, it's a, an adjunction. Mm. 
the F. Okay, so the uh, direction that I consider the arrow to be going to represent this geometric morphism is the direction of the right adjoint, uh, which I call F lower star. The left adjoint is F upper star. And such that, I'm not going to try and cram this onto this board, so you'll have to stay in suspense for a moment. Uh, should I go back to the first board? Uh, I think so, Billy, is that? No, we can move on to Um, all right, so I've introduced toposes for a reason, and that's that um, they are used in categorical logic. So, um, fact. Uh, toposes represent geometric theories. in the following sense. Uh, so if I have given a topos E, there is a theory T in geometric logic. Okay, I will explain briefly in a moment what geometric logic is. Um, but let me write the definition of the thing above first, uh, such that the category of geometric morphisms uh, from F E or F is equivalent to the models of T in. So naturally, in, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I should explain in, in writing this. So the first one is that I said that the left-hand side was a category. So I, I've told you what geometric morphisms are. And so those are the objects of this category. And between, between any pair of geometric morphisms, I have natural transformations between the left adjoint in the adjunction. So let me write that down to some extent. Uh, morphism F to G is a natural transformation uh, from F upper star to G upper star. OK. Uh, the next thing I should tell you is what geometric logic is. Uh, so this is a fragment of infinitary first order logic. Nope, wrong thing. Geometric logic is a fragment. So since this is essentially a uh, a, a logic meeting more than a category theory one. I'm hoping that I can talk about first order logic fairly informally. Uh, yeah, that would be fine. First order logic. Um, on I guess we the infinitary aspect that much. So I'd be interested in that. So I have existentials, I have oops, finite uh, conjunctions, 
I have set indexed disjunctions, uh, but I require here that the um, formulae appearing have finitely many three variables in total. So when I'm talking about infinitary disjunctions, I'm saying I have a set index collection of finitary formulae, and I can take the disjunction of all of them uh, on the condition that the free variables form, uh, that there are only finitely many free variables shared between all of these, um, or all of the formulae that I'm dis disjoining. Um, so note in particular, I don't get universal quantification um, and a theory in this logic is a collection of axioms with no constraint on how big that collection is of the form uh, phi entails over x psi where Psi, psi, formulae in geometric logic so implicitly here there is some signature that my theory is defined over right so this tells me what the basic language that i'm combining with these connectors is um, and x is a context and here by context i mean um finite list of three variables um sorry for all the random scribbles that's just not good at writing on a tablet so okay i've i've taught <laughs> I've I've written the, the axioms in this form, but of course it's not transparent what what the hell that's supposed to mean. Um, so I interpret this axiom as saying that um, for all um, variables in this in this context, so for all for all terms in the context of free variables, whenever the formula on the left is satisfied. The formula on the right is satisfied. So, i.e., for all x, uh, y implies some. Okay, so I don't have a universal quantification in the logic, and I don't have implication as a connective in the logic, but my axioms are allowed to use those exactly once each. Okay, this is kind of um, arbitrary, uh, but mainly because I haven't told you how any of these ingredients are going to be interpreted um, in, uh, in this situation. And I, I'm only going to go very, uh, very simply into details. Um, so what kind of things would you express with the infinite disjunctions? Um, let me give enough detail of, of what a model looks like. Uh, a model of T interprets the contents of sigma. Can, I audible? Can anyone hear me? I, I, heard, I heard you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Um, I, I just want to explain what an interpretation is okay, uh, yeah. before I explain how the disjunction okay. is interpreted. All good. Understood. Um, in, <laughs> in the in the so sorts become objects. Uh, I have some function symbols 
which get mapped to morphisms. I get relations, which get mapped to subobjects, <coughs> products. And similarly, formulae in context. So let me write that as x dot phi. So this is saying uh, one one of these formulas is inter is interpreted as interpreted as subobject of um, product of a again i'm i'm stating this all very informally the point is I have interpretations of the basic sorts. Those generate the interpretations of the formulas because uh, via uh, intersections and unions of subobjects. Um, Right, because I've already told you that relations get mapped to subobjects, and whenever I have an existential, uh, the the topos has the structure that I need to take the image of that map, and so obtain a subobject from a function. And so all of the things that I would typically think of as formulas, I can interpret as um, subobjects of some product of the interpretations of the basic sorts. And um, no, I've run out of space on this board, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do another dramatic such that oh, wait, I got stuck. <laughs> you took um, the hard way. Uh, okay, I'll go from right to left in this one. We have an axiom. the interpretation so whenever i have an axiom nt the interpretation of uh, the first formula in context is contained in the interpretation of the second one Okay, so recapping why I'm telling you all this. Um, the, not only can I interpret all of the uh, connectives um, in a topos, in the sense that subobjects have enough structure for me to interpret infinitary disjunctions, and I have the image factorization that I need to interpret existentials, but that is the structure that is preserved by geometric morphisms. And so I end up getting this functoriality in the sense that whenever I have, so if I have a geometric morphism from F to G, um, and M is a model of T in G, 
then f alpha star of m, where this is shorthand for I apply f alpha star to all of the interpretations of the components of, um, of my model, then all of that structure gets preserved by these inverse image functors. So I get a model of T in F. So that's the, the motivation for this, for this choice. So in particular, and maybe I should underline this in a color because it's important, um, a geometric morphism from set T, and this is often called a point of the topos E, is a set model of T, where T here is the theory, quote unquote, classified by E. So I, I mentioned that such a theory exists earlier. Um, it's not unique. There, there, are, there may be several theories classified by a given topos. Incidentally, this is another situation which is referred to as Morita equivalence. So the fact that I can take theories and I can construct toposes out of them means that I can talk about theories being Morita equivalent if they produce the same toposes. But I'm not going to um, spend any more time on that because that's not the Morita equivalence that I want to talk about so much today. Just so to, um, just to come back to I was very sketchy about that question. Yeah, just to come back to Billy's question for a moment. So an example of a, a statement you can encode with infinite disjunctions is something like, um, if you want to say two elements X and X prime are related by something, if there's a sequence, X equals X zero, dot, 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 X prime equals XN, right? To say that there exists a sequence, you could you can encode that in the language by quantifying over all integers. You can say infinite disjunction n in n, and then a statement that is dependent on n. That's one of the ways in which infinite disjunction is is used. Uh -huh. There must be many other ways. I was, I was wondering if you would use it to say something like, uh, like to exclude non-standard models. <laughs> sure. Like, yeah. Like, that's x right. equals zero or x equals the six equals the successor of zero or the successor of the successor of zero and so on uh yes you can you, you can do that um theory of torsion groups is the one i was going to give so so add Um, theory of countable sets. So I have CN, N and N. Uh, I have axioms. C i equals C j entails false. In fact, I should probably have mentioned false earlier. Uh, and here, this is in the nth context. And then um, true entails disjunction. So here is a true entails. Uh, X equals CI. So indeed that works. Um, and this is an example of a theory which is Morita equivalent to the trivial theory um, in the sense that there is exactly one model of this up to so this is right set there's exactly one model of this because any um two 
models of the natural numbers, um, which this turns out to be, I think, sufficient. Yeah, because I can I can equip this with with the structure that I need to show that this is a model of the natural numbers. Um, two natural number objects in a top loss are um, isomorphic to one another. Um, so there doesn't end up being a very interesting category of models of these in any top loss. So um, there's some examples. Uh, but to come back to the very start of the talk, uh, so T is classified by my continuous actions, then there is a rather special model, okay, of T and set, okay, uh, because we constructed a point constructed a geometric morphism from the top of the sets. And moreover, we said that the um, the F upper star, which was the forgetful functor U, entirely determined the, um, the, the, the construction of the category. It is a conservative model. in the sense that, so um, any uh, sentence Thank you. It's provable in the here. Um, so the thing I just said is sounds like a, a strong completeness result, which uh, essentially it is, except that I'm adding geometric here. So I don't, I can't go overboard. Anything geometric about this uh, model in the sense of things that I can express in geometric logic, um, I can actually deduce must be true in the theory. Um, but the main thing I want to point at in, in, in this situation is to say that conservative models aren't that common, like um, finding a theory and a model of that theory which has this property uh, is not so not so easy. So how does Uh, M is isomorphic to, and uh, now I have the problem that I briefly called my model M, so I'm definitely not going to do that because that, that clashes with uh, <laughs> with my earlier notation for, for monoids. Um, so then there is a very special model, and let's call it uh, E. It turns out I can reconstruct my group from this model. Um, all right. <clears throat> Here, this 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 is endomorphisms in set, right? Uh, in uh, not exactly. By in the sense, okay, it is endomorphisms in set, but of models, right? So I have to preserve all of the structure. I'm not just saying I take the underlying set of E and I take the um, endomorphisms of it. I need to, I need the structure preserving. Okay, I lost track a bit of. Okay, so to say it's classified by that is to say that the category of models of T in any uh, co-complete topos E is given by geometric functors from this particular topos to. E or the other way around, is that right? 
Uh, yes, not the other way around. Exactly the first thing. You okay, good. <laughs> um... So, so I, you're, you're I'm just, you're just... Well time, yeah. Okay. So uh, I think I understand. So I'd like to, to conclude and then I'll take some further questions. If that's okay. Um, so I started the story by talking about continuous monoid actions and I ended up only really talking about discrete ones. Uh, the, the point is that if I take a, maybe I'll, maybe I'll grab another board just to, just to uh, finish up. I could I still have a forgetful functor from uh, from the continuous actions of any topological monoid. And in fact, it factors nicely through um, the same monoid with uh, the discrete topology. Okay. So can reduce monitor equivalence problem to uh, identification of special models. Of a theory, and this kind of kills two birds with one stone because it, on the one hand it says I can be presented as a category of actions of continuous monoid if and only if I have a special model, and different special models may give me um, different presenting monoids. Uh, and so the the actual thing that I wanted to present here is um, if I take T theory of infinite decidable sets uh, then by uh, sheaves okay the 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 thing I just wrote down is relatively unimportant, um, but the point is that all models are special. And even if you don't understand the topos expression that I wrote down, you know what infinite decidable sets are because they're just infinite sets. Uh, maybe I should say objects. But the, the models of this are literally just the infinite sets. Um, so, and x with the induced topology which i haven't had time to tell you how to construct uh, these are all all marita So this example shows, firstly, that um, I can have very non-trivial Morita equivalence classes because I'm telling you that for any infinite set, I can topologize its endomorphism monoid or indeed its automorphism group um, and get a presentation of this same thing. And so the continuous actions of all of those um, groups are equivalent, even though there isn't actually any group homomorphism or monoid homomorphism between any. Uh, I think the last thing I said might be slightly stronger than I meant, but I'm going to end there. So that, that last comment, you're, you're just saying that the Morita equivalent are not equivalent by some other more elementary form of equivalence which would just say they're sort of trivially the same thing exactly yeah. exactly um this is not something that you could guess by constructing um easy transformations between these things hmm. yeah cool 
Thanks. Um, you were finished. Was was that what I heard correctly? Yep. Great. Um, questions for Morgan? So, so why why is this conclusion significant? I guess is what my question is. So you've got these things that are not trivially equivalent, but we find out that they are Marita equivalent. Why do we why do we get excited over the fact that these are Marita equivalent? G is a root group. So um, this is in contrast to the discrete case uh, classifies G torses, which in set are all isomorphic, i.e. Marita equivalence collapses to isomorphism. So the first reason that this might be surprising or exciting is because for discrete things, uh, discrete groups specifically, um, Morita equivalence collapses. There is only one, and in particular, there aren't even any topological monoids uh, distinct from the original discrete group um which uh which classify the same thing unless the topology ignores uh some of the multiplication that's happening so a thing i omitted to mention earlier is that i can kind of trivially collapse down the the topological monoid um by identifying anything which is not seen by the topology so up to that reduction um, the only things which are classified by um, the actions of a group are that group. I don't get anything else. Um, there, there are probably other reasons that I can give, but I don't want to talk for ages if that's satisfying enough. <laughs> yeah, but we kind of would want to see an example where you don't get this collapsing, right? I mean, if we haven't seen Marita equivalence before, then mm -hmm. I want to know why we want this in a case where we don't have something else. I mean, if Marita equivalence collapses to isomorphism in a particular case, then yeah, I care about Marita equivalence because it's the same notion as isomorphism in this example. But that destroys the subtlety of Marita equivalence, right? It's like, when do I go out there and find Oh, okay, these things are not isomorphic and I never would want them to be isomorphic. These are just clearly distinct objects. But but boy, oh boy, do I wish that they were married to equivalent because then I could do this with it or then I learn this structure about it. I imagine it's like Olivia's whole program of carrying information through married to equivalence, but I don't I don't have that kind of intuition. So it's also a bit of a high standard. I mean that's there's a kind of end in itself within mathematics of understanding in what sense two things are the same i mean the kind of classification <clears throat> so i mean if if a priori you care about the two objects i mean suppose there are two monoids that actually arise naturally to prove that they are merida equivalent is to know something about the relation between two natural objects that is worth knowing in and of itself i mean Mm. I, I don't think there has um, to be I more mean, than that. I mean, it's, it's the reverse of, I want to know what I can tell about a monoid, a topological monoid, by looking at its category of actions without necessarily going all the way to reconstructing it. Like, reconstruction is something I can do as soon as I have one of these models, but maybe if I have something and I suspect that it's a category of monoid actions, and I can detect properties of, of this mm. thing. So, so maybe I only have part of the information about what my top loss looks like. I want to know what I can conclude about the monoid that I started with. And the first step to doing that is 
getting a, a proper feel for what the Morita equivalence classes are, because if you have properties which are uh, not common between two monoids which happen to be Morita equivalents, you know that those properties are not going to be captured by, by the topple. So my, my example of this um, is discreteness. So you might get the impression from this discrete group example that um, whoa, whoa, a, tree, a tree appeared. Uh, that um, yeah, that happens a lot here. Just keep going. That that uh, discreteness is what what's special about the situation. But it turns out that if as soon as I expand to two monoids, uh, I can give you an example of a monoid of a discrete monoid and a topological monoid, which is not discrete, which um, are Morita equivalent to one another. Mm. <laughs> so like, I can't hope to find that property, uh, to, to present the property of discreteness as a property of the positive action of, of that thing, mm -hmm. which was quite disappointing yeah. to be honest. But, um, <laughs> Uh, the, the one thing I, there are a couple of things that I want out of this eventually. One is to know whether uh, commutativity is Morita invariant, because that seems like it could be the case. Um, another is whether uh, I can characterize free monoids. So, in principle, it seems so, but I don't know how, I don't know exactly which properties I need to identify in a, a top loss. In order to say, well, the monoid that produced this is free. So. Yeah, this is <clears throat> very much in line with a lot of modern geometry, uh, which is uh, characterizing geometric properties in terms of categorical properties of categories of sheaves. Um, mm -hmm. So this is a, from from my point of view, a very natural way of trying to recognize classical structures as being either categorical or not by looking to some category of representations mm -hmm. to see if it is lives at that level or not uh, that yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah it makes sense um, i'll just state the example one mentioned which is um the bicyclic monoid uh if if i equip that with the discrete topology I'll, I'll let you Wikipedia what the bicyclic monoid is if it's not familiar. Um, and if you're if you're feeling really enthusiastic, you can you can figure out what um, how one might construct the uh, alternative special model of that thing um, whose endomorphism monoid produces the counterexample to discreteness. All right, thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Morgan. Now I have to wait for Will to come in and, and help me escape. <laughs> <laughs>